So last year, Angular and React were effectively the same framework. Probably you're thinking, this makes no sense, right? Angular uses classes and templates, and React uses functions and TSX or JSX. How is this even possible? Well, large chunk of the responsibilities of any front-end framework out there is to keep the model in sync with the view. And that's where Angular and React used to operate very much the same way. So my name is Minko Gechev. I am the product and developer relations lead for Angular at Google. And I've been also working on converging two frameworks at Google, Angular and an internal framework called WIS. This allowed me to figure out what a web framework consists of and see a lot of, a lot of similarities across frameworks, see how we are converging on very much the same ideas and very much sharing the same implementation over time. Now, let's go back to Angular and React. In both cases, we'll create components, right? We'll be using classes and templates for Angular or functions and JSX for React. But that's only the interface that we are interacting with. After that, the framework is going to completely forget about the syntax that we use to create our components. It is going to build some abstract data structures or a component tree that contains some state. And the responsibility of the framework will be to keep this state inside of the component tree in sync with the UI. This is often called as reactivity or propagation of state over time. That's where Angular and React were very much the same last year. In both cases, we have to specify that the change, the state has changed. In React, we're going to do that with hooks. In Angular, we have something called zone.js that assumes that the state might have changed. Right after that, the framework is going to traverse this component tree by default from top to bottom, and it is going to find all the differences and apply them to the DOM. Let's look at a more practical example. Here we have an app component that uses two other components, user profile and a shopping cart. Their implementations are pretty simple. The profile component just displays a user name, and the shopping cart component iterates over a collection of items from a shopping cart. And for each one of these items, it displays the quantity. It's quantity. Under the hood, once you run your application, the framework is going to build a component tree similar to this one here. We have the app component at the top, we have the user profile component on the left, and we have the shopping cart component on the right. If we update the state of the cart, let's say we change the quantity of the first item to be one, both Angular and React are going to perform change detection or reconciliation, but very much the same algorithm. They're going to traverse the component tree, going to the root at first. After that, they're going to go to the user profile component. Nothing will have changed to that point because we are not using any of the state in these components yet. And finally, we're going to go to the shopping cart component that contains the modified item, and we're going to update the view. In both Angular and React, we can prune part of this component tree. So instead of traversing the entire component tree, we can just traverse part of it. Here, with on push change detection strategy in Angular or memoization in React, when we update, the first item in the card, we can just traverse the app component and the shopping cart component without going to the user profile component. But we're still performing some unnecessary operations. And for large applications, these manual optimizations, they could be hard to achieve. And additionally, well, they're manual. The framework doesn't do that automatically for us. So we need to think about it and have certain understanding of the runtime. Now, if you're still not convinced that Angular and React were very much the same last year, let's look at some benchmarks. Now, the font is a little bit small, but the purpose is to mostly look at the shape of these performance benchmarks and look at patterns. Both Angular and React are performing pretty poorly for swapping roles, and both frameworks are performing decently well for partial updates. This is with React Hooks version 18 and with Angular's legacy control flow. Since then, we changed our different algorithms, and things look slightly differently. So for the simple example that we demonstrated here with the small component tree, which has only three components, it doesn't seem like a big deal that we'll have to traverse these 
three components. Whether we traverse one or three, it's not really a big deal. It's going to be pretty fast. But real-life applications, they are different. They have hundreds or thousands of components that are alive the whole time. And if we have to traverse these component trees, component by component, in order to find the differences and reflect these differences in the view, it's going to take a lot of time. So Angular decided to improve its reactivity story. We started exploring introducing static dependency tracking in Angular on top of the compiler that we already have. We looked at other abstractions as well, and we decided to move forward with signals. So we joined the signal clubs together with Ember, Solid, Vue, Svelte, Preact, and others. Now, React has a slightly different approach here. We can talk about it later. But you can see that all these frameworks are now converging on the same reactivity primitive signals. And even though React now uses a compiler, if you look at the compiler output of the React compiler and the Angular compiler, things look very similar as well. We use the same optimizations where we are tracking the static parts of the view and the dynamic parts of the view. Here is how Angular uses signals. So we have a title property here that we're assigning to a signal, the string world. And when we read the value of the signal inside of a template, here we're letting the framework know that that's the exact place where we need to track for changes in the title property. So when we update the title property, the framework can go to this exact place in the view and update the UI, instead of having to traverse this entire component tree and look for changes. So looking at our larger component tree here, let's say we have a signal item.quantity, and we have read it in different parts of the component tree. When we update it, we're going to go only to the affected components and update their corresponding views without having to traverse this entire data structure. Signals were very interesting for a lot of framework authors outside of Google, but they're also very interesting for the WIS team inside of Google. The WIS framework has been historically used for different use cases compared to Angular. It is more similar to frameworks such as Astro and Quick. In fact, WIS introduced the concept of resumability about 10 years ago, and later on, Quick borrowed it. And it has been serving more consumer applications where performance is specifically critical. You can think Google Search, YouTube. And on the other side of the spectrum, Angular has been historically more used for enterprise-like clients, Google Cloud, Google Analytics, and others. However, over time, we noticed that the requirements for these frameworks, they started converging as well. People who were using Wiz, they wanted more of Angular's features. And people using Angular wanted more of Wiz's features as well. So I was assigned to figure out how we can converge these two different frameworks at Google. I was part of the leadership team, the Angular team, and also the Wiz team, and looking up for opportunities where we can collaborate. So reading through the Google chat of the Wiz team, I saw that they had been collaborating with YouTube to re-implement the UI of the platform, move it from their legacy virtual DOM implementation to Signals. At the same time, the Angular team was working on integrating Signals as part of the framework. So we decided to team up. And as of right now, the whole traffic, mobile traffic for YouTube mobile web is using WIS with Angular Signals. They saw significant improvements in performance, for example, on smart TVs, they saw 35% better input latency. Scrolling in YouTube Shorts on mobile web, they saw 60 frames per second compared to their jittery 25 frames per second with virtual DOM. Seeing that signals work pretty well across these two different frameworks, we reached out to standardization bodies and we looked for opportunities to introduce signals potentially to the web platform. The standard bodies, they reached out to other framework and ecosystem authors, and we joined forces together to introduce signals to the JavaScript language. As of right now, signals are in stage one, or this 39, and the reference implementation uses Angular signals because it proved that it can work across multiple frameworks and it scales with YouTube, the second biggest website in the world. So, 
Converging two different frameworks is something that I haven't heard of people doing in the past. In fact, framework authors have been trying to diverge even though there are certain ideas that turn out to be best practices and we end up converging on them. So how is this going to manifest to web developers? Well, in practice, this is going to be just gradual improvements that we're introducing to Angular over time. And in the process, we'll be seeking opportunities to open source primitives that are established as best practices in the industry. Like Signals is one example. I'm going to share another example about event replay later. So looking at what a framework is built of, we can see like a couple of different abstractions, like many different abstractions, actually. Reactivity, authoring experience, we have rendering, this view structure that I talked about, event handling, dependency injection. Now, I know that if you're using Angular, you might be thinking, no way. React has no dependency injection. And uh, well, if you're using, I guess, React, you might be thinking, no, Angular doesn't have a context API. What if they're serving very much the same purpose? In both cases, we want to inject data in our components based on the context in which they're used in. So in Angular, we do that with dependency injection. In React, we do that with context API. They seem to serve the same purpose very much. They have slightly different look, but they also share very much the same data structures under the hood. So converging two different frameworks is not a trivial task, and it could potentially lead to a lot of changes in these frameworks. So we're paying a lot of attention on stability. And in Angular, we guarantee this by making sure that every single change goes through a pull request. Like we have over 27,000 pull requests to the Angular repository. Each one of them is reviewed by like, people who are really familiar with the source code that has been modified. And also, each one of these changes goes through dozens of different checks, such as end-to-end -end tests, unit tests, size regression tests, golden files, and many others. But I'll say probably the one that brings us the most confidence that we haven't broken anything, something called the Google internal tests. So every time when we change something in Angular, we open a pull request, we're syncing the source code from the pull request to the Google internal monorepo, which has about 4,500 Angular applications there, some of them with millions of lines of code. And we're running the test for all the affected applications to make sure that nothing changed, nothing broke. This means a lot of pain for us, debugging all these tests, code that we've never seen before. But it also guarantees an unmatched backward compatibility. All right, so we talked about convergence on signals, reactivity, and we discussed convergence on view structure and also touched on dependency injection or context API. I have a prediction that we'll be also converging on event replay and fine-grained code loading. By fine-grained code loading, I mean reasonability or partial hydration or the island architecture that uh, Astro has been advocating for lately. Let me first start talking about convergence on event replay. So how do we usually serve a web application? The user would open their browser, and in the navigation bar, they're going to enter a URL. From there, the server is going to respond with HTML. We're going to find all the reference scripts, JavaScript and CSS. We're going to download these scripts. Right after that, we're going to execute the JavaScript. We're going to fetch some data from the server. And finally, we're going to make our application interactive. This could take a lot of time on a slow network. There are certain optimizations we can do. Probably the most obvious one would be to use server-side rendering. If we server-side render, we'll have to we'll provide this markup to the user, so the browser would already render the application, but it will still not need to download JavaScript and execute it, perform hydration, in order to make the application interactive. And there is an interactivity gap down there. So in the meantime, between the user seeing the structure of their web app and being able to interact with it, there might be a couple of hundreds of milliseconds. So the way we've been solving this in Google Search over the years is with something called Event Replay. Here we have a mock of a very simple app. When, when the mock is gray with these dashed borders, the application has not been hydrated yet. And when it becomes dark blue, this means that it has been hydrated. So we can start interacting with the application before it has been hydrated. And in the background, we can start recording the user events. When the application gets hydrated, then we can replay the event in the order in which we have received them. 
Hopefully, the application is fast enough that this phase of event capturing and event replace is not going to last for more than a couple of hundreds of milliseconds. And this way, we will not lose any user interactions. This currently is uh, achieved with a library called JS Action or Event Dispatch. It is a library that we worked on modernizing and moving to the Angular Mon repo, so you can find that it is the same code that powers the event replay in Google Search. It is on github.com slash angular slash angular. And we added support in developer preview for Angular. You can enable it by using provide client hydration, specifying the with event replay feature. There is another opportunity to improve performance, though. We can shrink this time needed for downloading the JavaScript and executing it by serving just less JavaScript. Wisk has been achieving this with resumability or with like, some fancy partial hydration, where we implicitly specify which is the minimum code required to handle a particular user interaction. So we don't download the whole application. We download only the minimum amount of code that is required to respond to a certain user interaction. And well, in Angular, we can't do it in the same implicit way because we're going to break a lot of applications. Also, it doesn't really fit the paradigm that developers are using Angular with today. So we introduced something called deferrable views. They allow you to create kind of like interactivity islands in your application or hydration islands in your app. With deferrable views, you can wrap part of your UI inside of a block and specify that you want this block to be hydrated only when a particular condition is met. This is the semantics when using server-side rendering. So this way, when we send a request from our client to the server, we can get the markup of our application. And ahead of time, we'll have created different interactivity islands with these deferred blocks. Let's say we're using on interaction as a hydration trigger. So when the user starts interacting, let's say, with the left navigation bar, we can download the corresponding JavaScript from the server, and we can hydrate only this part of the app without, without downloading anything of the remaining functionality. So we can download the minimum amount of JavaScript required to handle this particular user interaction. And with event replay, we can replay the event also that we don't lose any clicks, let's say. There is one more thing that we've been working on, though, and it is figuring out our reactivity graph so that there are data dependencies. Let's say the navigation bar updates data that is used in the top bar. We should be able to hydrate our application and update the view. So today, out of these boxes that any web framework consists of, we covered only a few. We covered reactivity, we touched on event handling, and a little bit of dependency injection. There are way more to cover. And this is from framework author's perspective. Adios Mani recently published a table from web developer perspective about features that are available in each individual framework. She shared that at Google I.O. 2024, a couple of months ago. And uh, I modified the table a little bit to reflect my own view for the feature set in the world. We can see that we're very much converging on the same features as well. So what does that mean for web developers? How do you even pick a framework nowadays? Well, when picking a framework, don't overthink it. It will end up being the same technology anyway with a different facade. But I'll say there are a couple of pointers that maybe sometimes we overlook, and they're really important when picking a technology that we're going to use in a project that is going to serve real users and is going to be used over the years. Probably the main one is stability and reliability. We want to make sure that we're using a stable solution that is going to be with you over the long run. And it's really important to have also a rich ecosystem that is inclusive and supportive of you. And something that you really enjoy using. So thank you very much, and now you can go and build great apps. <laughs> <laughs>